The year 1942 was a fulcrum on which the fate of the world was balanced. On June 4, 1942, the momentum of the war in the Pacific shifted when the U.S. Navy sank four Japanese carriers during the Battle of Midway. After Midway, Japan did not have another victory in the Pacific. In the autumn of 42, the British broke out from El Alamein. They prevented Rommel's vaunted Africa Corps from taking control of the Suez Canal. More importantly, they kept Germany from gaining free access to the oil of the Middle East. Rommel's defeat was the beginning of the end for the Wehrmacht. Throughout the merciless Russian winter of 1942, two million man armies held a ghastly death grip on each other in and around Stalingrad. Some contend Adolf Hitler ordered the conquest of Stalingrad because of his hatred for Joseph Stalin. Some contend that Stalin's ego drove his order to defend the city with, quote, not one step backwards, unquote. Whatever the reasons, in six months of street-by-street -street combat, 1,530,000 had been killed, wounded, or captured. On February 2nd, 1943, 93,000 German troops surrounded in Stalingrad surrendered. Only 6,000 of them would live to return to Germany. Hitler's army was in retreat in the east from then on. There was another pivotal battle that took place in May of 1942, one that was little noted or long remembered. Following the fall of Rangoon in March of 1942, the Japanese 56th Brigade the elite Dragon Division, poured up the Burma Road through China's back door. The last big obstacle between it and the wartime capital city of Chongqing was the Salween River and its mile-deep gorge. If we had not stopped these people at the Salween River, China would have collapsed. And if China had a collapse, we'd have had a different situation in the world. On May 7, 1942, the 56th Brigade seemed unopposed as it flowed up the Burma Road, China's vital supply line, until David Lee Tex Hill and seven other American volunteer pilots dived their war-weary Shark's Tooth P-40s into the mile-deep gorge of China's Salween River. Fitted with 500-pound Russian-made bombs, the Flying Tigers made a desperate attempt to prevent the complete collapse of China. It was a mission that would change the war in the China-Burma-India theater. I'm Gary Sinise, and this is Missions That Changed the War. In a sense, David Lee, Tex Hill, and the 20th century China he loved and defended grew up together. When Tex was born on the Korean Peninsula on July 13, 1915, the modern Republic of China, formed after the fall of the Qing Dynasty in 1912, 
was a struggling three-year-old. I was born to missionary parents. I was born in Korea, and I was the youngest child, and uh, uh, Daddy's health broke down. He'd been out there a long time, and I was only a year and a half old, so I don't remember a whole lot about Korea. Daddy uh, came back to Virginia, where all of my people are from, and uh, he worked on Grandpa's farm, and uh, I, I, then he bought a place himself. And my early recollections there were, were working out there on the farm. Well, Daddy was a great preacher, and he got his health back and, and started back into preaching in a little church called St. Elmo there. And he was called to uh, Louisville, Kentucky, First, Pres First Presbyterian Church there, and was there a couple of years. And then he was called to San Antonio in 1921. This was a big, big church, an old church here. And, and people just loved Dad, and he built it into the biggest uh, Presbyterian Church in the Southern Assembly. One of Dr. Hill's benefits was the use of a church member's home in the Texas Hill Country near San Antonio. Texas, in particular the West Texas of the 1920s, was a place that shaped young David Hill's world ever after. I say that my earliest recollections, of course, were my family, and my dad was uh, predominantly uh, remembered because uh, he, was a, he was a great outdoorsman, and he took me hunting and fishing. He was a great fisherman and hunter, and from my earliest days, you know, I uh, learned to hunt and fish and live in the outdoors. In those days, living in the outdoors, you know, it wasn't like it is today. I mean, it was primitive. We had our bedding rolls and built a big fire at night and lie down and, and uh, get up at daylight in the morning and daddy would fix breakfast. But that type of life uh, I uh, enjoyed so much and uh, in a lot of my early days I, I worked on ranches and, uh, and uh, I liked that type of life, you know. Anybody I think that, uh, that's been in the outdoors it, it equips them very well, you know, to do what we were doing later on, you know, as far as uh, a fighter pilot operation. Beneath the boundless Texas skies, another fascination was growing in the mind of young David Hill. You know, when we first came to San Antonio in 21, we had a Korean that came over and he lived with us, uh, Dr. Moon, Young Nim. And he taught me how to make kites. And the Koreans are great on, on kites. And uh, flying kites uh, was really a great hobby. I built many of them. And he had some very fancy kind of kites that you don't normally see. And that kind of got my interest. I had a good looking sister and I had a good looking cousin. And uh, these the guys from, from McKelly would come around with a helmet and goggles on, you know. And I thought that was pretty cool, you know. David Lee Hill's growing fixation with flying finally pushed him to commit an uncharacteristic act. A guy by the name of Chet Schluter and I decided that we were going to take an airplane ride. So we took our collection money and slipped off from church and went out here to a place called Winburn Field. But it's uh, right over there near Stinson, actually. We paid this guy a dollar to take us around the pattern. Uh, a guy named Dick Hare was the pilot. And then a travel air, you could always tell because the aileron stuck out further than the, than the wings. And the uh, pilot sits in the back, and you got a, a seat, side-by-side -side seat in the front. Thank you. 
I just remember that it was just uh, a real thrill, and then I uh, began to worry about my conscience taking <laughs> taking my collection money on Sunday <laughs> for an airplane ride. Young David Lee was also intrigued by his father's remembrances of the Far East. I didn't want to get back to the Far East, and uh, I'd heard Daddy speak about it. Tex Hill would indeed return to the Far East, but as a boy hunting and fishing the West Texas Hill Country in the 1920s, he could never have imagined the circumstances under which he would make the journey. A world away from Tex Hill's West Texas, 4,000 years of dynastic rule in China were coming to a complicated end. Modern China was born in October 1911 in a military uprising that led to the abdication of China's last emperor. The birth of the Chinese Republic brought with it great promise and great danger. The nation that rose from the ashes of the old Chinese dynasties would, in the next century, shake the world, not once, but many times. The people of China have shared a common culture for more than 4,000 years, longer than any other civilization on Earth. The earliest Chinese settled in northern China, in the Valley of the Yellow River around 3000 BC. They farmed the fertile river valley, made pottery, wove silk cloth, and used simple wheeled carts. The history of China prior to the 20th century could be characterized as a continual struggle against foreign occupation. The first known dynasty appeared in 1766 BC, the Shang Dynasty. New methods of agriculture helped give rise to a highly developed system of king, nobles, commoners, and slaves. With well-organized armies, the Shang kings unified the region and defended it against nomadic raiders. Shang craftsmen worked in bronze and jade. The Chou overthrew the Shang kings about 3,000 years ago, and the Chou dynasty lasted for 900 years. Iron tools opened more land to farming and created food surpluses. A middle class arose. Chou kings unified the country, created the first national library in 550 BC, and supported priests, scholars, and teachers. Among the scholars was the philosopher Confucius. His code of ethics, developed around 500 BC, was the foundation of Chinese thought and culture for the next two and a half thousand years. The Chou kings worshipped heaven as a deity. They and all of the kings and emperors to follow would be called sons of heaven, and China would be called the celestial empire. Ancestor worship emerged during the Chou dynasty, and it is still a strong influence in all Asian cultures. The early Chou kings ruled a realm that was divided among some 200 nobles, similar to the feudal system of medieval Europe. Strong nobles overthrew weaker princes until, by 400 BC, there were only seven states in the kingdom, each ruled by a noble family. In 221 BC, the strongest of these noble families, the Qin, declared themselves emperor. Their reign lasted less than 100 years, but it left two important legacies. The Qin gave the country its name, China, and replaced the feudal system with a centralized bureaucracy. For the next 2,000 years, China was ruled by a series of emperors, some strong, some weak. The country was divided and unified many times over. Chinese emperors built the world's first university in 221 BC, built the Great Wall, standardized weights and measures, and created a civil service based on merit and education. The Chinese invented the world's first sundials, water clocks, wheelbarrows, compasses, paper, canal locks, firearms, and super ships immense seagoing junks that could carry 1,000 passengers. 
over and over again, the settled farms and cities of China were attacked by nomadic foreigners from all sides. The Chinese called all such foreigners barbarians. Mongols from the northern plains conquered China in the 13th century. Their short 90-year rule left a much larger legacy in the West. When the Venetian merchant Marco Polo wrote about his travels to China, he described the court of Mongol Kublai Khan. His book, Marco Polo's Travels, was a bestseller in Europe for 300 years. In the late 1600s, China entered a long period of peace and prosperity under the Qing emperors. Western traders and missionaries were welcomed, but the army was neglected and a population boom brought a shortage of land and a rise in poverty. In the 19th century, two wars against Western powers, the so-called Opium Wars, left China defeated and humiliated, forced to open its markets and ports to free trade with the West. Poverty, war, and foreign meddling in internal affairs led to several rebellions that ravaged China's economy and weakened its emperor. The Boxer Rebellion of 1898 was aimed at expelling all foreigners from the Celestial Empire. It failed. The terms of the peace imposed by Japan and the Western powers humiliated the Chinese and rallied support for nationalist revolutionaries. One of the leaders who emerged from the turbulent 1890s was Dr. Sun Yat-sen, a physician who advocated replacing the Manchu dynasty with a republic. After a failed uprising in Canton in 1895, Dr. Sun fled the country and lived in self-imposed exile, traveling and enlisting support for his revolution. In October 1911, Chinese soldiers staged a rebellion in Wuhan. Within two months, all the southern, central, and northwestern provinces had declared independence from the emperor's rule. In February, the Manchu emperor abdicated peacefully, ending more than 2,000 years of imperial government. Sun Yat-sen returned from exile to lead a transitional government in the new Republic of China. In March 1912, Sun Yat-sen stepped down from the presidency and Yun Shikai, former commander of the Northern Army, took his place. Several revolutionary groups merged to form the National People's Party, the Kuomintang. General Wan set up a Republican government headed by a premier and cabinet. He drafted a constitution and laid plans for a parliamentary election in early 1913. But behind the scenes, Wan had his opponents assassinated and moved to sideline the parliament and weaken the constitution. Less than three years after his inauguration, Wan declared himself president for life and began scheming to make himself emperor. But in 1915, Japan exploited the turmoil with a list of demands for special trading rights and other privileges. The resulting crisis shattered Wan's control, and he died in 1916. Finally, in 1921, Sun Yat-sen succeeded in forming a new Republican government. And in 1921, David Lee Hill was an impetuous eight-year-old attending Traverse Elementary School in San Antonio, Texas. Well, I was always in some sort of trouble. Uh, I went to Traverse School of Say, and I remember <clears throat> Miss Barry, who was a principal, uh, she, uh, back in those days, you know, they believed very much in corporal punishment. <laughs> and uh, I had a run in with Miss Barry, and, uh, and uh, she, she broke out the switch. World War I ended with the Treaty of Versailles in 1919. China had joined the Allies in declaring war on Germany. At the peace conference in France, the Chinese demanded an end to foreign treaty ports and other concessions in China. 
Their demands were ignored, and they felt disillusioned and betrayed. There were angry demonstrations in Beijing and other cities. The government, frustrated with its Western allies, turned to Russia for help. The Communist Party of China, led by a peasant named Mao Zedong, held its first conference in 1921, but it was so small that the Soviet Union gave its support to Sun Yat-sen's Kuomintang, or KMT. Soviet aid built up the KMT army, Soon died in 1926 and was succeeded by Chiang Kai-shek. Chiang was born October 31, 1887, to an upper-middle-class family of salt merchants. He would go on to become one of the most powerful and controversial military and political leaders of the 20th century. Growing up in a tumultuous China, racked by military defeats at the hands of foreign powers and civil wars among warlords, Chang decided to pursue a military career. Ironically, Chang entered a preparatory school for Chinese students in Japan, the Imperial Japanese Army Academy. It was here that he was influenced to support the movement to overthrow the Qing Dynasty and establish a Chinese Republic. Chang returned to China in 1911 to serve as an artillery officer for the revolutionary forces. Over the next decade, with political guile and personal loyalty, he gained Sun Yat-sen's trust. On June 5, 1925, he became Generalissimo Commander-in-Chief of the National Revolutionary Army. In 1926, Chang launched an expedition to subdue the northern warlords. He accepted Soviet aid, but began throwing communists out of the Nationalist Party. By 1928, the warlords were reined in, and the country was once again unified. Chang continued to suppress the communists. They began organizing in the countryside, and their numbers grew quickly, fueled by anger over the slow pace of land reforms. In late 1931, they declared a separate Chinese Soviet Republic in the South, with Mao as chairman. Chang began a series of brutal extermination campaigns to destroy the Communist Party. And in Chang's preoccupation with the communists and disloyal warlords, the expansionist Japanese saw opportunity. I went to the Sandon Academy and graduated in 28. Military school, one of the, it is the oldest military school. It's something like 120 years old. But at that time, uh, it, it was a high school level. And the, uh, the professors, they had to be tough because they had some tough guys in there, my older brothers especially. Like the other day, I was at the alumni day and and because uh, I'm a white rabbit, I mean, I'm the oldest living graduate. And uh, I just told these kids, I said, you know, you guys are the hope of the world. I said, if you guys don't make it, I mean, this country's gone. Because uh, we have well, nothing we can do at our age. And I said, just remember this to any audience that I've ever talked to that if you see a guy in uniform, you better get on your knees and thank God, because that is the only guy in the world that can save you. In the fall of 1928, Tex Hill enrolled in the Macaulay School, another prestigious military school near Chattanooga, Tennessee. His restlessness and pranks earned him many disciplinary restrictions. When he graduated at 17, Tex was ready to enlist in the Navy, but his father had other ideas. He strongly encouraged him to enter college. Tex graduated from Austin College in 1938. So in the ad in the paper where they looking for pilots. So I went down and <clears throat> took the exam before I graduated. You had to have a college degree. Now I tried to get into the Army Air Corps earlier, and I was turned down, and I don't know why. You could go in with two years I quit uh, two years of college. I, to this good day, I still don't know why I was turned down. 
And uh, I don't know whether it was my eyes or, or what, I, I just don't know. But anyway, it was kind of funny to wind up after a career in the Navy and everything. And then in July 42, when our group broke up, you know, the Army Air Corps wanted me bad. In China, the Japanese were capitalizing on the domestic turmoil facing Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek and the nationalist Chinese. Japan saw Manchuria as a limitless supply of raw materials, a market for her manufactured goods, now excluded from many Western countries by Depression-era tariffs, and as a protective buffer state against the Soviet Union in Siberia. Japan occupied Manchuria in 1931 and set up a puppet government in northern China. There was the growing anti-Japanese feeling in China, but Chiang ignored it. He declared that he would deal with Japanese aggression only after he had dealt with the communists. Finally, in late 1936, the Kuomintang army forced Chiang to give up his anti-communist campaigns, form an alliance with the Chinese Communist Party, and face the Japanese threat head on. Six months later, a skirmish between Chinese and Japanese troops at Beijing's Marco Polo Bridge set off the spark that ignited all-out war between China and Japan. In 1937, when China's resistance to Japanese aggression escalated into the largest Asian land war in history, the military career of Tex Hill was just getting started. The career of an Army Air Corps pilot who would change Tex Hill's life forever was seemingly coming to an end. Claire Lee Chenault was born September 6, 1893, in Commerce, Texas, and raised in waterproof Louisiana, a tiny farming town in the Mississippi Delta. He had a pleasant childhood, Tom Sawyerish by some accounts, though he later described himself as something of a loner. He attended a one-room schoolhouse and in 1909 entered Louisiana State University at Baton Rouge. He was a good student and participated in ROTC and in basketball, baseball, and track. He also applied to West Point and Annapolis. As an adult, Chenault always gave his birth year as 1890, adding three years to his age. After one semester at LSU, he transferred to a teacher's college and a year later, in 1910, at age 17, went to work as the teacher and principal of a country school near Shreveport. Chenault married Nellie Thompson on Christmas Day, 1911, and left teaching to find work that would support a family. The United States entered the First World War in April, 1917. Chenault quit his job at a tire factory, joined the U.S. Army, and earned the rank of first lieutenant. Stationed at Fort Travis in San Antonio, Texas, he was near Kelly Field, the Army's pilot training base. Chenault snagged an assignment to Kelly Field as a drill instructor. He was still at Kelly Field when the war ended and he finally got the assignment he had hoped for, as a U.S. Army aviation cadet. Private flying lessons had taught him some bad habits and a civilian instructor at Kelly washed him out of the aviation program. A second check ride with a military pilot got him reinstated and he earned his U.S. Army wings in April 1919. He served a brief tour patrolling the Mexican border and was given a routine discharge into the Army Reserve. When Congress expanded the Army Air Service in 1920, Chenault re-entered active service as a flying officer. He served mostly in non-flying assignments until 1922, when he was sent to the famous Hat in the Ring Squadron 
the 94th, at Ellington Field, Texas. Chenault proved to be a superb pilot. After a year in the 94th, he was given command of the 19th Pursuit Squadron based on Ford Island at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. And Chenault flew coastal patrols and set up an early warning system of aircraft spotters. Deafness was a common problem among military pilots of the day who flew open cockpit airplanes. Chenault was no exception. He flew with a medical waiver for deafness, logging over 1,300 hours in the air. In 1930, with the rank of captain, Chenault was sent to the Air Corps Tactical School and joined the faculty as head of the pursuit section. It was the birthplace of the doctrine of precision daylight bombing, the idea that fast, heavily armed bombers would always get through to their targets. A tight-knit group of officers, who became known as the Bomber Mafia, believed that the bombers' speed, high altitude, long-range, heavy armament, and tight formations would overcome any defenses thrown at them. Boeing's new YB-17 bomber seemed to confirm these claims. The prototype that would become the B-17 Flying Fortress could fly faster and higher than the Army's frontline fighters, and it bristled with guns. No anti-aircraft shell can reach it, and no pursuit plane can catch it, so said the advocates of daylight strategic bombing. They claimed that fighter escorts would be unnecessary Besides, they said, even the best pursuit planes lack the speed and the range needed to escort the bomber. As a student at the tactical school, Chenault met Captain Clayton Bissell, a World War I ace. Bissell was a true believer in the bomber doctrine. Chenault disagreed. The Army had recently received the new Boeing's P-12 biplane, the world's fastest and most agile pursuit aircraft. Chenault believed that pursuit planes like the P-12 could shoot down bombers. But, said Chenault, progress would also bring faster, more capable pursuit aircraft. Bissell and others believed that the age of the pursuit plane was over. While the bomber mafia won converts in Washington, Chenault practiced aerobatics and thought about pursuit tactics against bombers. He and Bissell would clash again over tactics in China during World War II. The commander of the tactical school asked Chenault to form an exhibition flight team for the Army. Flying P-12s, they put on a three-plane aerobatic show like no other. At the team's final performance in late 1935, there were two men in the audience who would later have profound influence on the life and career of Claire Chenault. One was William Pauley, a salesman who represented the Curtis Wright Aircraft Company in China. The other was Mao Pang Chu, a senior officer in the Chinese Air Force. Both men were impressed by what they saw that day. Mao offered to hire all three pilots as flight instructors for the Chinese. Chenault's two fellow pilots accepted the offer and soon left for China. Chenault declined. In Italy, General Julio Douai declared that bomber formations could reach any city and that fighter aircraft would be useless against heavily armed bombers. Douai's ideas became required reading at the U.S. Army Air Corps Tactical School. The U.S. Army's 1931 war games had only strengthened the argument when pursuit planes were unable to catch a single bomber. Chenault's experience on the aerobatic team convinced him more than ever that fighters could shoot down bombers, diving attacks, concentrated gunnery, and teamwork. He argued for better tactics, better communications, and an early warning system that could direct fighters to incoming bomber formations. But in Washington and other places that mattered, the bomber mafia had won the argument. Chenault was seen as a difficult officer, a competent leader who argued too much with his superiors. The funny thing is, is that uh, Chenault had been right all along about the requirements for fighters, 
versus bombers and how he's an outcast in his own Air Force. He's given a foreign Air Force in which he could implement it. And his tactical decision was to use the best fighters he could obtain, which in the event turned out to be P-40s, and use their maximum capabilities. And he knew that the, uh, from observation, he knew what the Japanese strengths were. He had seen the Nakajimas and the, and the Mitsubishis over uh, China, and he knew that they were good airplanes, but that they had certain qualities which could be offset by the qualities of the P-40. So he was playing a winning hand, uh, although it seemed, uh, you know, that it, it would be hard to define that to begin with. He actually knew what he was doing. He actually knew what tactics to use, and, and he was able to uh, uh, achieve what he wanted to do. Chenault's health was also a problem. He was active and energetic, but he was flying on a medical waiver for his deafness. And his chain smoking, up to three packs of unfiltered camels a day, was catching up with him. Chenault could see that his military career was effectively over. Promoted to major, he was sent to the 20th Pursuit Group as its executive officer. There, flight surgeons grounded him, then sent him to the hospital. The Army invited him to retire, which he did in 1937. He and Nellie had bought a farm near Waterproof, Louisiana. Nellie was content there, but Chenault was not. He had been quietly negotiating with the Chinese to study and analyze the Chinese Air Force, a three-month assignment at far above his Army pay. The day after he retired from the Army, Chenault boarded a ship in San Francisco bound for China. Tex Hill had a date to keep in Appalachia, Florida. He had enlisted in the United States Navy as a seaman second class. Along with 110 other candidates, he was now going to Florida to try to gain acceptance for flight training. I rode a motorcycle down there, going through Louisiana. Most buggy hit those goggles and just have to stop and wipe your goggles off to even see. Never seen anything like it. But I got down to Opelika and uh, they, they wouldn't let me keep it on the base. And so I went through and uh, made it down there. There were uh, 12 of us uh, out of 110. Uh, 10 of us out of that 12 were sent to Pensacola for flight training. I rode my motorcycle back and uh, sold it. I'm sorry because there's the first 61 Harley it's a Harley 61, it's the first one that came out that had the overhead valves on it. I think they called it a knucklehead. It, it, that, that bike was, today, would be worth a lot of money. And uh, at Pensacola, uh, the, the training was uh, probably the best in the world. Uh, we had almost 13 months training. And when you came out of there, well, you, you, you're qualified to do anything. And you're ready to go to the fleet. Texas training was thorough and intense. There was 55 hours of aerobatics and gunnery in an F-4B4, then primary seaplanes, the N-3N on floats, then to squadron three and steermans, then to instrument and fighter training. And in training, Tex showed the characteristic self-confidence that would later make him an Air Force legend. You know, everybody, you know, always sweating. I wonder where you're going to pass these checks or not because they a heck of a lot to do with the instructor. Or they can teach you to fly because then they got other check pilots that are going to check you. But uh, I've always, you know, had confidence in myself. I, know. I mean, I know what I can do and what I can't do. <laughs> like, like this old friend of mine <clears throat> gave me some sage advice. He said, Tex, don't ever lie to yourself. <laughs> Yeah, I went to the Saratoga and uh, I was flying TBDs. Uh, I never will forget when I reported on board, there was a guy who took me in hand by the name of Bob Dosey. He had been in a much earlier class back when he had cadets. On my orientation ride, good God, he was looping that damn thing and doing rolls in it. And, and boy, I tell you, to wash that real fast. 
If you'd have done anything like that, you know, in Pensacola with uh, air, that airplane. Through it all, Tex held his desire to return to the far east of his birth. And I had no, no problems, uh, uh, but I did want to get back to the far east. And uh, I'd heard Daddy speak about it as a missionary, and, and I wanted to get back over there. And we had a heavy cruise over there called the Houston. The Navy was real good about letting you tr make a transfer. Well, I'd put in for a transfer to the Houston. Well, fortunately, it didn't go through. Houston got sunk. I was transferred to the East Coast to the Ranger flying uh, SB-2U dive bombers. It was kind of interesting because we actually were involved in war before we really were. And, and the way we were involved, uh, we were operating out of Bermuda, where the East Convoys would make up. The Brits uh, had a, uh, a task force that would, would escort these people and kind of shepherd them, you know, the, the convoys going over with supplies. As fate would have it, Tex Hill would indeed be involved in the war before we really were, but it would not be as a member of the U.S. Navy, and he would return to the Far East. Unbeknownst to Tex, half a world away, an aviation visionary who had been driven out of his own Air Force was busy readying his accommodations. Uh, we were stationed in Norfolk and walked into uh, the ready room, and, uh, and there's Gus Redhelm. He said, here's some guys that'll go with you. He was our operations officer. We didn't even know what he was talking about, you know. And he introduces this Commander Irvine. He said, uh, Commander Irvine said, we're looking for volunteers to keep the Burma Road open so supplies can flow into China. And, uh, we didn't even know where Burma was. He pulled a big map. <laughs> this is Burma, this is Burma Road. Supplies going on up into China. So I was anxious to get back anyway. But Ed Rector and me and Bert Crispin, and there were seven of us off that carrier that wanted to go. The way we were actually structured, uh, Sonora could come to the States. Uh, China, Air Force had been decimated, it was in name only. And uh, they needed an instant Air Force if they were going to stay in the war. And Sonora came back, and Hap Arnold, George Marshall, Admiral Tower, Stimson, they, uh, they were all against it. I said, it's just one of Chenault's pipe dreams. So Chenault, through a guy named Joe Olsop, who has kin to the president some way. So he was able to set up a meeting with Chenault and Roosevelt. And Chenault convinced Roosevelt that if you want to keep China in war, they said, you don't have to have an instant air force over there. So they set up all this stuff. And it's a funny thing because there's a requirement that Chanel wanted, he wanted 100 fighter pilots for $500 pursuit experience. And General Arnold told him, said, he said, Chanel, if I were to give you that many airplanes, that many pilots for that kind of experience, he said, you'd fold up my entire pursuit section. And, Chenault always endeared himself by saying, generally, if you can't spare that many people with that kind of experience, you don't have any pursuit section to begin with. <laughs>